Okay, good morning everyone. I think it's time to start. Uh, so first of all, I apologize again that I canceled the class on last Thursday, but hopefully uh, that will bring uh, more time for you to finish homework one, which is about all about the same trees. And from this homework, uh, uh, hopefully you kind of have a feeling that how um, you you implement uh, the uh, specific machine learning algorithm and uh, test it with the real data set and confirm um, your implementation is correct and say how it is uh, how it is working on real data set. Uh, this is uh, uh, of great importance in our class because our class is not a, it's just the theory class or some paper just to talk about uh, every problem on paper. We do emphasize practice. So uh, in the following a few uh, homeworks, as we uh, mentioned before, we're going to have uh, uh, six homeworks in total. That have finished two. And the remaining four homeworks, each homework I will have such a uh, programming uh, part. And again, uh, I will suggest you guys to start doing homework as early as possible. Although some algorithms might seem uh, too straightforward or simple for you, but you do need some time to uh, debug it, to make it work. And also for some program, programming assignment, you might need to generate quite a few results. That means you need to let your code run for a while. Not like the last one hour, so you can clap all the results. For example, uh, the, maybe you have noticed that we have released uh, our homework two. That is third homework. We start from homework zero, one, two, right? The third homework is released today. And after today's class, you should have, uh, you should be well prepared to do every problem. And uh, that's just mainly focusing on uh, either boost uh, back in random forest uh, and also the linear regression, this mean square regression uh, problem we, we're going to wrap up today. Right, is, uh, the algorithm uh, does seem um, like uh, uh, straightforward to many of you, but uh, uh, if you look at the problems, uh, you will see that uh, you are requested to generate quite a few results. Like you are you're, you're requested to generate 500 trees. And look at the bagging fact, right? Look at how the uh, variance and bias decomposition can be sig significantly reduced by using a bagging tree, right? So that, to look at that, in fact, you do need to generate a lot of trees. That means you have to spend a while running your code. So again, don't rush at the, first, at the last day or the last few hours. That won't make, uh, that, that won't make, make it. Okay? Okay, so um, before we jump to the, uh, the, the detailed topic uh, today, uh, I want to share some uh, suggestions or tricks uh, to debug uh, ML algorithms. So, uh, I yeah, this uh, uh, is done by, I, 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 by, by looking at uh, our past uh, few weeks of uh, experience and problems, feedback from the campus and also office hours. Uh, we found uh, 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 a few students are ki kind of like uh, 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 anxious about their implementation or not sure about the correctness of, of your algorithm. Uh, well, technically, I won't think I won't think this is an issue because uh, our course, the prerequisite of this course, uh, assumes that everyone has capability of programming, right? has the debugging experience, uh, even. Uh, Someone asked who asked me for the code. I, I, I always confirm with your uh, capability of programming and debugging. So technically, don't worry. You guys are good. You're qualified. You're you're well qualified to implement all the all models and algorithms. I think the problem here, if you still are not confident with your implementation or feel kind of like uh, anxious, stressed out, as many, uh, many it's mainly because uh, you're doing ML programming. It's not uh, like other programming, typically other programming. 
So here I want to uh, share a few suggestions and tricks I used uh, for years and years, which I think is very effective. And uh, and uh, I think if you just follow those tricks and to debug your homework problems, so even even uh, even to debug your own research code, if you're doing research, that will be fine. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very confident with my own implementation. And my implementation of, uh, of models and algorithms is much more complicated than what we <laughs> we're going to discuss in our class. OK, so <clears throat> what kind of suggestions? So first, uh, keep in mind, this is a fundamental principle in software engineering. Right? If, you, if you have taken that, that class before, Right. So no one can guarantee your code is completely correct. So this is a fundamental principle of software engineering, right? No matter what kind of uh, top engineers uh, you are, what kind of team you are, right? You can only prove your code or your software uh, has bugs. You can never prove they don't. They're bug free. So don't be stressed. I mean, don't be stressed. It's a, it's, a, it's an extremely common. Right? You have some kind of bug. And even uh, it runs, uh, at most times, very well. It does not mean uh, your implementation, your software, your code, your libraries uh, uh, is about great. Okay. What we need to do is that, okay, in most cases, we just uh, ensure the results are reasonable and good. That's enough. OK? So uh, and what is the common use of strategies to debug? Right? So I mean. Uh, I mean, in a general sense, right? No matter what kind of uh, program, what kind of code you're writing, two strategies: white box and black box. So, white box. What is white box? You just examine every line of the code right? and check line by line, and check variable by variable, check function by function, check by uh, class by class and ensure the whole uh, logic is correct, or at least is consistent as uh, what you design. Right? This is very important. Right? So you, you, you always need to do, to do the white box test first, and then proceed to the black box test. So what is black box test? As the name suggested, Will your implementation as a black box, right? Now just a test with a variety of inputs. And change the settings and the inputs and look at the outputs and see if these outputs are correct, right? This is called black box test. So basically nearly all the software companies or even internet companies, they have these two uh, two two uh, strategies uh, for code uh, for, for, for debugging the code, right? So for white box text, uh, they might have um, you, have, you might have heard of that. It's called code review. Right? You want to submit a code to the repository, and then you must uh, uh, you must be approved by some of the colleagues, right? Several colleagues they they're gonna review your code and then and uh, make sure everything is good, including the style, because uh, uh, nowadays like modern software words, uh, they require the readability, so you cannot let your style of code to be messy. But right now, is, this is not required in our class. Right? We would just require, OK, you implemented the basic logic. Right? The, the correction. So and then black box test, right? you, the, the, the modern uh, companies, they might have a, uh, a, a special team, right? so, um, the testing team. Right? They are in charge of generating all kinds of uh, test data points and results, and then conduct tests. Right? If you're doing an internet company, you might need to do some online tests. Right? You, you kind of like a branch, uh, a stream of the online data and into your uh, stream them into your uh, your your code and then and look at the results. So those are uh, much more complicated. We don't need uh, that complicated things, but the general idea is the same. Right. So <clears throat> what if you are not sure of your implementation? Right? When you implemented your decision tree, when you implemented your uh, this mean square regression or, or either boost, right? I'm not sure if my code is correct, right? And uh, what should I do? So first, don't ask TA or TM or instructor. Let them to confirm. We cannot confirm with that. Okay, okay. so uh, 
as we just mentioned, right? no one can guarantee your code is bug free. So don't ask here and here. If you answer this question, even you show them your code, you let them to uh, say a few running results of the code, they cannot answer yes. It's not possible. So, <clears throat> and then what should we do? What should we do, right? Before we, before we uh, proceed to several suggested steps, right? So don't panic about the correctness, all right, or completely, complete correctness of the code. Because you won't receive a zero grade because your code has bugs. So don't 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 worry uh, too much about the, the grading issue. Of course, if you do have code or your code it does not make any sense, well, possibly you'll get zero grade. But if, if you do make efforts and uh, and uh, generate reasonable results, uh, it's, it's very unlikely you get zero grade. So don't panic. Right? We're quite generous about the grade. If your code is logically right, that's why we ask you, we request everyone to do the web of test to ensure your code is implemented in implemented a clear way, okay? organized way, because we're going to look at your code, not just running your code. That's why someone asks, okay, can you just can I just provide exit executable file, right? Or exe in a Windows environment? I said no. Because we're gonna look at the code. As long as your code is logically right and generate reasonable results, what does what does reasonable mean? It does not mean it, 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 it by no means that okay, I give you this particular uh, data set or testing point. And I expect the accuracy should be exactly 97.5%. We won't test it like that. So usually we have a, an expectation. We know, OK, this particular algorithm, for this particular data set, their performance should be good enough, like 90% accuracy. So it doesn't matter if you find an end up with 91% accuracy or 92% accuracy, or even 89.9% accuracy. To us, they're, they're the same. So we'll check, OK, you might have some numerical issue. You might have a different way to deal with uh, uh, like floating numbers and double numbers and, and so on. There, there indeed can cause, it, it indeed can cause some uh, difference. But as long as uh, your performance, performance of code is over some expected threshold or expected bar, you'll be fine. Okay, any question regarding this part? How our, uh, how we usually read your code, look at your code, and look at programming assignment? Everyone's comfortable, right? So now, okay, let us talk about uh, the suggested routine. Right? And, uh, I will, uh, I will, once you have finished your implementation, I always follow these steps, like my own research or my project. So I'm always comfortable with my code. And uh, I will suggest you to do that as well, because not only because this can maximize your efficiency. You don't need to be struggling uh, like if it is correct, or the performance, actual performance is like that. You don't, you, you won't, you won't need to, you won't need to, uh, you won't be worried about that if you're following those uh, steps. Okay. So what is the very first step? Conduct a white box test. Look at the code line by line, function by function, class by class, and ensure your implementation logic is clear and correct. I believe this is actually the most important step. Because you need to ensure what you implement is what you want to implement. This is the very first step. So never, I mean, after your implementation, never just test it with some actual data. No, no need. First, make sure you are confident with your implementation. Then you can conduct tests. And then look back at your code because uh, it is inevitably, I mean, oftentimes that you make some uh, looking uh, seemingly silly questions, right? It's, e it's very easy to admit that. And but 
as long as you can guarantee the logic flow is correct. That's fine. <coughs> Sorry. This is also important because our TA and TMs will look at the code as well. So don't try to write a code to be, I mean, as organized as possible, as clear as possible. Uh, don't try to, I mean, optimize your code, the running efficiency from the beginning. It's unnecessary. A first hour class does not require, you can speed, speed up a uh, uh, machine learning algorithm by 1,000 times. The correctness is more important than the speed. Just to be clear, just to ensure uh, your code is clear, this is the first priority. Oh, what is step two? Someone may say, okay, uh, now that I can logically confirm my implementation is correct, why not just test on some real poor data set? Don't do that. Why? Because uh, uh, once your result is not good, you don't know if this is uh, because of your bug, the bug in code, or because of the performance <coughs> is indeed bad. You cannot, you cannot, you, you cannot make clear of that. So don't, I mean, don't do, uh, don't, don't, don't go to uh, the real world data set first. And instead, we need to uh, prepare a simple data set first. Prefer uh, preferably, a small synthetic data set. Like the example data set and the paper problems. So that's the usage, that's the value of our paper problems. So someone, some of you might feel, okay, it's so tedious, right? You have to manually do a lot of things, and which are which are same, which are really trivial, right? But we provide or request you guys to do those problems uh, uh, because of two aspects. First, we want you to manually do that to really understand the algorithm steps. Although it's kind of mechanical, but only you do it manually, you really understand the deep thing. A second thing, we want to provide some test examples. In the programming assignment, okay, you're gonna we collect some user ideas that those are all real data sets. We tested them. However, how can be back? The smallest data set will contain uh, uh, several hundreds or even tens of uh, hundreds or uh, thousands of uh, examples, right? You cannot manually calculate what is the exact entropy or what is exact information gain and so on, right? So that's why we suggest you to prepare a simple synthetic data first. And we have uh, we have had that resources. We have actually already prepared some data set for use. Like the uh, tennis playing example, right? Only 14 examples. We actually have listed all the uh, information gain, entropy, and the steps. Or the few like Bloom function examples providing our paper problems. Why not just use them? Less than 10 examples, uh, and then you know every step. What is the entropy? What is the branch of the tree? Uh, what is the information gain? Which var which uh, which which attribute should we use to split? And what is the tree structure? Right? You just do it one by one, step by step. And and once you go through the steps and uh, verify those steps are consistent with what you have done manually, and you're pretty confident your your implementation is correct. Okay. <coughs> No, don't do active test with doing that stuff. Otherwise, it's hard to keep up. Okay. So once you prepare this uh, simple data set or the data set right, using step-by-step -step debugging. So what is step-by-step -step debugging? You run one line of code, stop, and look at what is the intermediate variables, what is the intermediate parameters, and uh, check their values and say if their values are, 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 are as expected. Like when, when you run your decision tree, ID3, right? And step by step, like, uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to first look at the attribute set. If this, this is current attribute set is uh, correct, right? And then I look at the calculation. There's a follow loop, right? Goes through every attribute in the attribute set. I look at my, uh, I look, I, I calculate the entropy information gain by using each attribute to split data set. Right? And I have done that before, right? With those uh, sample data set, I know exactly value, and I just need to check if my code generates the same value. And by doing so, okay, you can verify every step if uh, your code is running 
number. Right? And correct it. I look at every variable. The algorithm, the entropy, the gain, the fractional counts, etc., is computed as expected. And then you go through the whole uh, running procedure once. And make sure your execution is the same as that in your mind. Once you have a, uh, arrived at this step, and uh, in 99% of cases, uh, your code is correct. I mean, logic, logic correct. It, I, I can guarantee it is correct in every case, but most of the cases should be correct. Okay. So this won't take too much time. Because your examples, your example data set are there. Right? Even if you don't have that example data set, you can manually make such a data set, like create 10 um, artificial examples and run it. It won't take much, take much time. 30 minutes, one hour, most. Okay. The benefit is that, okay, now we can basically run our reason on the test data set. Then we'll proceed to uh, step four, right? If steps one to three are good, oh, by the way, if you find there is any error in step one to three, just subtract it. And then re re redo those steps again. Okay? And it's pretty easy to find those uh, problems when you do this step by step debugging. Okay? And one thing I want you to emphasize that if you use Python in the terminal uh, environment, I will suggest you to use PDB. And this is similar to GDB, I mean, if you use the GCC compiler, GCC in a Linux environment, uh, the common use debugging tools for GDB, and for Python it's called PDB. So you can use ju just a few commands, uh, comments like N, uh, R, B, breaking point, and so, so on. You can look at every, whatever uh, intermediate variables and parameters uh, in the running of your code. And some, some um, a lot of you might prefer like IPython, IPython is an uh, interactive Python and run on the uh, on the web pages. This, that's fine. You can just print out the results. Right? You can print out the intermediate results. Whenever you run it, you can uh, you can you can you can verify uh, if they are correct or not. Good. And once you have a uh, down step one to three, and then go ahead and test with Google. And uh, again, just be careful, right? Just to ensure that uh, your results from uh, the, on the real data set are uh, reasonable, you still use step by step debugging. Right? You just, uh, just run one step and look at the results. But right now, you cannot manually calculate if this, those results are correct. But at least you can look at the values and look at the selections. You, you're going to have a sense if this is uh, working as a, uh, a norm. Okay? You're going to have such, such a sense. And then just do it step by step until you finish it, and then that's it. Just follow these uh, four steps. And finally, once you get the results, you might collect the tree structure, you might collect the prediction accuracy, right? And use some common sense to confirm if your results are reasonable. Because there is no ground truth for that. I mean, the ground truth meaning, OK, I have the ground truth label on the test set, yes. But there's no branch to tell, tell you that, OK, what is the exact accuracy should your algorithm achieve, right? But just use some common sense. For example, if your decision tree is expanded enough, then accuracy should be more than 50%, right? It shouldn't be worse than the random guess. Okay? And, uh, and uh, if you just expand, keep growing your tree, then you should see the training accuracy keep growing as as well, right? And test accuracy should, should grow some time, and then, and then some, uh, starting from some time, it starts drop. So a common used way is to uh, watch the training test curves to see if they typically, uh, uh, to see if, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if they are consistent with typical learning behaviors. Of course, they're implementing intervals, right? Remember, we actually have a stress down in the class. Right. The intervals of the learning curve are are not typical. Right. Even your training error goes um, goes down to zero, the test error won't uh, increase. It just the keep stable or even keep decreasing. So the typical behavior intervals. Um, if your implementation intervals uh, doesn't behave like that, then most probably you still have errors. You still have issues in your code. 
try to use uh, all kinds of those uh, common sense uh, to uh, to confirm if your re if your results are reasonable or not. Don't try to ask what is exact prediction accuracy should I get this particular data set. No one can answer that. Then you should be pretty pretty good with that. Okay, any question? Anyone still have uh, still having concerns about debugging your code, your ML code? Is it helpful? Okay, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'd love to share those experiences with you guys because uh, I, I I did use these tricks for my ML research for uh, like more than 10 years, I guess 15 years. I never feel confused about my code. Never feel like uh, not sure about my code. I know, I know. You know, every time this is a problem with my code or this is a problem with the method. So just, uh, uh, I mean, I would suggest to do that. And in most of the cases, you even do not need to exactly follow every step. And that sounds a little bit tedious for everyone, but uh, if, you, if you can follow most of those suggestions, uh, uh, you will be perfectly fine for, at least for these homework problems. Okay, so uh, uh, sometimes uh, you, might, uh, you might say some weird issues. Like your oil entropy is zero, or oil selection results, oil tree has the same structure. Right, that's weird, and and, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's not obvious. You can't you can't think of any uh, possible reasons, right? Well, uh, I I I I have have, have, have had experience uh, as well, right? So most of probably is still due to your own mistakes in some some uh, inconspicuous spot. Right? For example. I have ever, I once met a, a bug. I mean, the code is uh, exactly the same as uh, the previous version, and but the performance just become uh, became very, very bad. And in, uh, in my previous uh, environment, it works very well. And then I run it uh, in another desktop, it just, it, it just uh, you know, suck. It's really, I mean, heavy. I, I, I check every line of code. I'm, I'm pretty much sure um, it is correct. Right? And finally, it turns out to be the issue of uh, the Python version. Right? Python two, if you uh, if you if you if you divide by some integer, it's just doing integer uh, uh, divide by some integer. Right? It's just doing integer division multiplication. But in that, in that case, we want to do the continuous numbers. Right? So I have to switch to Python three. Your Python three, no matter uh, whatever constant you throw them into a script, they view it as a continuous number. So we won't have some such kind of issue. So that's, uh, I mean, those are kind of uh, weird problems. So if you happen to have such a uh, problem, uh, and you, can, you cannot solve it immediately, uh, be patient. <laughs> Just be patient. And uh, usually at this uh, stage, uh, it's uh, not very helpful to ask uh, others, because no one understands your code better than you do. Right? So what you need to do is that carefully debug, and again, step by step, and look at the results after executing each lab of code, and try to narrow the scope. Try to narrow the range of the bug. And finally, you, 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 you'll find it out. OK, that's uh, all the experience I want to uh, I'll share with you about how to uh, more effectively and efficiently debug a code. Hopefully, you won't suffer from uh, this uh, issue anymore. But I do believe uh, everyone, everyone in our class is capable of doing that. If you if you stress up, it's just uh, uh, I think it's a psychology issue. It's not a, a capability issue. Um, to summarize, debugging of uh, ML code has nothing different with uh, other programming practices. Same issue. So you follow the same practice, uh, just be patient, be careful, and I highly suggest you to follow standard routines and you will be fine. Okay, any questions? Any concerns?
Everyone's good? Okay, great. So later I will uh, uh, highlight this uh, link uh, because I have already uploaded it to the course website. I'll highlight this link in the, uh, in the cameras so that uh, hopefully it will be uh, it will benefit to your uh, implementation of the uh, remaining homework assignments. So now. Let us continue with our uh, linear models. So in the last lecture, we have uh, introduced uh, the linear models, right? So basically, we have linear classifiers and the linear regression. So linear classifiers, if we focus on binary classification, <coughs> how do we define linear classifier? Any thought? Whatever linear classifier learning algorithms you use, right, they follow the same rule to do the classification. So what's the classification rule? We got a classification function, right? Or sometimes we call it decision function. So this function is a linear function. Meaning that, okay, it is just a linear combination of all the input features plus a bias parameter. Right? So if you still uh, have some impression, the classification function is written as uh, w1x1 plus w2x2 plus da 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 plus wdxd. Suppose you have d features, then plus a bias parameter b. So this is called classification function or decision function. Then we just look at the sign of the decision function. Right? If it's positive, then we predict the label uh, to be positive. Otherwise, we predict label to be negative. So this is a definition of the linear classifiers. Yeah, and then we discuss uh, the uh, geometry view of uh, linear classifiers. This is a nice property of the linear classifiers because uh, uh, your decision function can determine where the classification boundary is, right? The classification boundary is essentially an equation, right? An equation that the uh, classification function is zero. And they separate all the examples in the instance space into the positive part and negative part. And also, uh, we discussed uh, some other properties like uh, any the, 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 the vector which is uh, perpendicular to the classification boundary, essentially a weak vector. Right? So, this comes from our uh, preliminary knowledge about geometry. Everyone should have uh, learned them before. And in our <coughs> remaining uh, 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 lectures, we're going to spend quite a few discussing uh, several linear classifiers from perception to support back machines, from logistic regression to, uh, uh, to, to naive waves. Right? And, but now, uh, we, we're going to first uh, talk about the least mean square regression. That's for linear regression. Uh, the reason is that, okay, we're going uh, to first finish up this, and then we're, uh, from which we can introduce uh, several fundamental optimization algorithms which are used everywhere in machine learning area. Okay, so what is linear regression? First, it is a regression task. So our goal is to predict a continuous label or continuous output given your feature representation of the examples. Right? So uh, we actually have uh, discussed uh, this example in the last lecture, right? Just to reinforce the uh, the uh, idea, right? Suppose our goal, we want to predict the mileage of a car from its weight and age, right? So uh, here we, we have collected uh, several examples, right? And for the first car, we have this weight, and we have this uh, age, then we have its mileage, right? Weight from the, uh, uh, from, 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 uh, uh, which can be weight from the car, right? So <clears throat> then what we want is that we want to learn a function that can predict the mileage using the two features I explained next to. So this is a typical uh, regression problem. And you can make a, make a lot of other examples. For example, uh, how do we predict the uh, temperature of tomorrow, right? Given a bunch of features. And what about linear regression? So as the name suggests, literally, 
uh, we, we're going to predict these continuous labels with a linear model. That's it. Uh, we, assume, we assume that the output is a linear function of the input. So mileage is our output. Right? And we assume, OK, uh, the mileage is essentially a linear combination of these two inputs, the width of car plus and bus term. So here, for convenience, we write the bus term by W0. And uh, the coefficients for x1, x2 are denoted by w1, w2. Oh, by the way, we haven't discussed why should we use uh, this bus term in the last lecture, right? In a classification case, uh, uh, the reason we use the bias term is that we want to uh, want more flexibility. If we require w0, or the bias term to be 0, then the classification boundary can only must pass through the origin. Right? That will restrict the flexibility. So similar arguments apply here. We assume mileage uh, is also a linear combination of the existing features plus W0. But in, yeah, another way you can view this is uh, an augmented uh, feature. Right? You have an augmented feature 1. So we actually have three feature values. 1, x1, x2. So W0 view is viewed as another way. So we have a, a weight vector consisting of uh, W0, W1, and W2. So the mileage can be simply written as inner product between the weight vector and uh, the feature vector. So our goal is to use the training data to find the best possible value of the W. So that, remember W here includes W0, W1, and W2. And once we have learned this optimal weight factor from data, from training data, given the values of x1 and x2 for a new car, then we use the learned weight factor to predict the mileage for the new car. So here is the general framework for linear regression. I repeat mean, uh, again, although we have discussed uh, about that at the end of the last lecture. So assume our inputs are vectors from a d-dimensional space. Right? So here, the input x uh, includes the augmented features, namely constant, constant 1. And uh, <coughs> outputs are real numbers. Right? And suppose we have collected uh, a training set, x1 by 1, x2 by 2, to xm by m. So for any input x, input vector x, we want to approximate output as a linear function. So uh, as we just uh, mentioned, right, the input vector includes the constant feature 1. So we can write the uh, output as a linear function, w1 times constant feature 1, which is w1, plus w2x2 plus da 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 plus w x d, and uh, it can be conveniently written as inner product between the d vector w and the augmented feature vector x. Any questions so far? OK. So we have uh, uh, shown several examples. Uh, for example, if you have only have one input, right? You are actually, and those blue dots are training data, you are actually predicting uh, y values using a line. Uh, if you have two inputs, uh, your output is a third dimensional. You are, you are actually using a plane in the three dimensional space to uh, fit to those training uh, set. So now, given the training data, how do we know which weight is the best one? That's the critical question. Because uh, the learning procedure in general is a search procedure. We want to have some guidance right, to guide our search, uh, the optimal weight factor, from the hypothesis space. So here, we need to address the question, which weight vector is viewed as the best one for the training set? And to address that question, we define a loss. So the idea is similar to like, human teaching and learning um, procedure. Right? So I give you, I, I want to train, uh, train you some capability or some, some ability. Right? So how should I do that? I, I give you a few problems, right? So if you're if you solve that problem, 
uh, you might get some reward. Like, or if you make some mistakes, you got some penalty or cost. So you got a bunch of problems. Uh, uh, you solve them uh, uh, probably with some uh, errors. Then you got some cost, right? And you, you need you, you need to be penalized so that it can encourage you to do better and better until you, your your errors are minimal or you don't make any errors. So similarly, in the machine learning literature, we use uh, we define a, a loss which evaluates our performance for each for predicting each particular example. Right? So <coughs> suppose we're given a specific input x i y i in between set, right? So what's the cost of mistake? We use our current grid vector to make prediction, right? And then just look at actual difference between the label and your prediction. So this is the defined cost. So of course the larger difference between a prediction and a wrong choice, the more cost you have to pay, right? The larger penalty you have to endure. Right? So overall, we want to, our total cost on the training set to be as small as possible. And in linear regression, at least mean square regression, we take the square of each cost and then sum over the square cost over all the training examples. And then we want to find out a weak vector which minimizes this summation of square errors or square cost. Someone asked, why should I take square over that, right? And by the way, why should I put a one half as constant from that, right? So uh, this is just for computational convenience. Nothing special. And uh, of course, you can replace this square error by the absolute error. You can do that. Right? Then you find that the optimized value accordingly uh, is uh, much harder. So that's why we take square. And just be aware, this uh, square loss uh, has some kind of issue. If you're making a big mistake, your cost is double. Right? So using this loss or this cost function to train the model actually highly discourage you making big mistakes, even for a few examples. Because this big mistake can dominate the loss function. But but they allow you to make many, many small errors. This might work well for, I mean, practice uh, in most of the cases, but uh, uh, might not be a profit for a few other uh, cases. In that case, you can switch to other loss. I mean, there's a no, uh, there's not a, a loss which is uh, better than anyone else. And as to why we put a constant factor one half here, uh, the reason we'll see it later. When we take the gradient, we have a constant factor two here, two and two here cancel. That's it. We don't want to uh, preserve an extra constant coefficient. That's the only reason. Okay. Any any question regarding uh, the definition of loss? Okay, so now our strategy, given the loss function defined over the whole training set, right? our strategy for learning is to find the weight vector W with the least cost, which is to minimize this uh, cost function. So this is our goal. And uh, if you're using this, uh, if you try to use, try to minimize the summation of square error to do the linear regression, this is called least mean square regression. That's where this means where uh, this term comes from. Okay. So <clears throat> now we have uh, converted the learning problem into an optimization problem. Right? Our our task is to uh, solve this optimization issue. Right? So there are a variety of uh, optimization algorithms. And but here we're gonna discuss uh, uh, two strategies which are widely used. Uh, uh, in, um, in, in machine learning area. One is called gradient descent, the other is called stochastic gradient descent. Okay. So, so what is gradient descent? In general, gradient descent can be used to uh, uh, optimize uh, any function. 
for example, uh, to minimize any function as long as the function is a, is a differentiable. Right? So here g of w can be any function, but here we just uh, put it as our um, uh, square, summation of square laws for this uh, mean square version. Right? So here is a general framework. And uh, we first, we're going to start with some initial guess for w, cw0. Then we'll iterate function convergence. In each iteration, we first compute the gradient of uh, our objective function j at the current rate of wt. Then we update wt to get wt plus 1 by taking the step in the opposite direction. That means by moving wt to wt plus 1, you are approaching uh, more to the minimum of the function g, of the objective function g. Why? Why should we move from the current speed vector toward the opposite direction of the grid? The gradient is steepest ascent, and we want to minimize, so we need to go the opposite way. Yes. So this is actually a common uh, knowledge that is the gradient direction of the increase, and it's uh, also the a steepest uh, direction to increase the function locally. Okay. So uh, if you're not sure of that, apply table expansion uh, on any function, you'll see that. So the gradient is the direction of the increase in the function. But right now, our task is to minimize the function. So we go the opposite direction. To be more intuitive, right? let us just, just look at this particular objective function. And <coughs> we conduct the gradient descent steps. Let's see what happens. So at the beginning, we initialize our wave vector at here, right, W0. Of course, it is uh, quite far away from the minimum, right? So we calculate the gradient. So the gradient here is actually the slope of this uh, uh, tangent line, right? So now, uh, who can tell me? The direction of the gradient. Remember, the gradient here is with respect to a scalar, right? So the direction is either positive or negative, right? Either from this direction or from this direction. So now, what is the direction of the gradient? Along this way, right? Why? Because uh, the slope is positive, right? The slope is positive means that gradient is positive, and then you move toward the gradient direction, that means you move along that right hand side, right? Along right, or to the right, right? Along that direction. So you can see that if you move along the right direction, you're actually increasing the function, right? So this is consistent with what we just said, right? But right now, because we're going to minimize that function, so we need to move uh, toward the opposite direction. That is uh, to the left, right? To so move toward the opposite direction, you get W1. So you get W1, you can see that W1 is closer, we get a closer to the minimum, right? And now you calculate the, the gradient again, which is the slope of this uh, counter line, right? So again, this uh, slope is positive, meaning that the gradient direction is still to the right. right? That's what you should do. Yeah, you move uh, toward the opposite direction again to the left, right? You get W2, and you calculate to the gradient again, you get W3, and uh, you move uh, toward the, uh, the opposite direction of the gradient, and finally you will either arrive at this uh, minimum or you are close enough to that. So this is a gradient descent framework. Any question? Okay, so <clears throat> now let us uh, apply gradient descent for our least mean square regression, right? So again, we're going to first initialize our weak factor, denoted by W0. And now we run through many, many iterations uh, until convergence or the maximum number of updates have been done, right? You can choose whatever stopping criteria you like, right? 
And then inside the integration, we first compute the gradient of our square loss at the current B vector, as you denoted by this uh, nabla j, right? Then an update to Wt as follows, right? This is how we express gradient decipher. Wt subtracted by the gradient multiplied with some step size r. Right? So minus gradient here is uh, the opposite direction of the gradient, right? And now you need to determine how much you want to move, move, uh, um, move uh, along, along the negative or opposite direction of the gradient. Right? This uh, step size is called r, is, uh, r is called learning rate. And then once you have updated your mid vector, right, you will finish this current equation, you move to the next iteration, and now you calculate the gradient again inside. Uh, Inside the next, next iteration, you get gradient, and then you, have, you move uh, the current bit vector along the opposite direction of the gradient with step size r. Right? You do it again and again until uh, all your iterations are done. So the remaining question is how to compute the gradient of the uh, square loss that we're talking about. So now let us look at the computation, right? So now you can see why uh, we, we need to review our basic knowledge in home for zero, right? Practice uh, the calculation of the gradient with respect to a vector. So suppose we have a D weight in our weight vector, right? D elements in our weight vector. So the gradient is essentially a vector as well. So each element will be the partial derivative of this uh, square loss over the particular partial of the particular weight. So remember, weight vector W is always D elements, right? So we're going to calculate the partial derivative uh, over partial WG, right? WG, without any uh, loss of generality, because uh, you can just apply the same formula to all the other weights, right? So, let us take the partial derivative of, of this uh, summation of the square loss uh, with respect to WK, right? And just apply uh, what you have learned before, right? So you take the partial derivative over the summation, you can just move the partial derivative into each uh, sum, right? So you take the partial derivative of each uh, square arrow, right? And uh, by the chain rule, you can build this uh, difference, this error, yi is subtracted by w transpose xi as a whole, right? You apply the chain rule, and then you move to the power in front of as a coefficient, and then you take the derivative, uh, uh, and then, 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 then this, this part is, uh, is, uh, is left with, with itself, right? And then apply the chain rule, you take the partial derivative of this uh, error with respect to wg. So now you can expand this uh, in the product. You find that yi subtracted by w transpose xi, yi subtracted by w1 xi1, subtracted by w2 xi2, blah, blah, blah. Right? So here, xi1 means that the first feature of uh, the instance or example i, right? And in this uh, uh, term, right? All those terms, uh, only one term is related to WG, which is WG times XIG. All the other terms are either YI or different weights multiplying with the different features. So if you take the partial derivative over this whole, uh, and it, 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 it equivalent to take the partial derivative over this uh, minus WG XIG, right? So which is just a, fir uh, uh, a first order term, uh, with the, the, the gradient simply minus x and g, right? and you multiply the two terms uh, before, which is two times uh, error, right? And now we can see why we put a constant half in front of this summation. We got a two here, right? And you got a half here, which is just next. And you can move this uh, negative sign in front of the summation, right? You got a partial derivative of our uh, total loss over the partial derivative of each particular weight, WG, right? So which is summation, minor summation, yi minus sub, uh, subtracted by W transpose xi times the corresponding feature in each example, right? For J's element, the corresponding J's feature in each example. So 
So we calculate one element of the gradient vector, and of course we want to we want to calculate the full gradient vector, meaning that we can loop through all every grid element to get results. But again, as we uh, emphasized before, I would encourage you to uh, write the gradient vector in terms of matrix uh, vector formulas, like matrix uh, vector products or summation, all kinds of stuff. That would be uh, that would be much more convenient. So if we look at the result of this gradient, we find that uh, it has uh, an interesting structure. So you can see that the gradient with respect to a particular weight, say J weight, is <coughs> essential, essentially a summation of the product of the prediction error times the corresponding input feature. Right? For weight J corresponds to feature J. Right? And just uh, multiply them together, add them together. Of course, don't forget to uh, put the minus sign in front of it. In other words, this error, this prediction error, with the curve lead vector, is shared in computing the gradient with respect to every weak factor. So if you prefer to use uh, like a for loop to implement this, just uh, I mean to be more efficient, I mean, it's better for you to first uh, calculate the error in predicting each uh, train example and store them beforehand. Okay. Any question regarding this uh, derivation? I think it's pretty standard. Great. So now we have a computer. We have we have we have derived the gradient of the square loss with respect to every element, right? So in this uh, first step, in step each iteration, we first compute the gradient uh, of the loss function with respect to the current weight vector, right? How do we do that? We evaluate the function for each training example to compute the error, which is the difference between the ground truths and uh, the prediction, right? And construct the gradient vector. We multiply the error with the corresponding feature and uh, add them together, right? Once you uh, have done this, you, uh, you, you obtain one element of this uh, gradient, you look through them, you've got a gradient vector. Once you've got this gradient vector, you apply the gradient descent, right? You just apply this formula. And you finish one iteration, and then you proceed to the next iteration until the total error is below a threshold or whatever other uh, criteria you prefer. <laughs> So again, here R is called step size or the learning rate. And for now, let us assume it is a small constant. And in your, uh, your implementation, you can just uh, tune it with a small constant. And this algorithm, although it's pretty simple, right, pretty straightforward, is guaranteed to convert to the minimum of uh, the objective function J. Right? And J here, the square summation of the square loss function over the training set, it has a, another nice property that J is convex, meaning that any local minimum is a global minimum. So you just apply the three descent, and when it converges, it converges to uh, the global minimum of the J. But you might ask, what if J is not a convex function? It is not a convex function applying gradient descent as long as you choose a property step size R. You are guaranteed, guaranteed to converge to a local uh, station point, meaning that your gradient is uh, zero, and that's that. That will be uh, enough for most of the applications. For example, uh, in neural networks, right? the loss of neural networks is really highly nonlinear, non-convex, so no one can guarantee you find a global uh, outcome. But uh, really, if you can um, arrive at a local minimum. Uh, that would be good enough. And this algorithm framework uh, has already provided enough details for you to implement your gradient descent for this mean square equation. So, any questions so far? Everyone's good?
Okay, now I want to uh, request you to think of uh, the potential problem of this. What's the potential issue of the grid design? Any thought? Um, can you end up finding like a local minimum but not like the minimum for the whole function, I guess? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Absolutely right. Yeah, this is uh, this is actually <laughs> the issue for almost all optimization algorithms. So if you want to use those uh, global optimization algorithms, which have some guarantees like uh, simu uh, simulated and mini, that will be much much uh, slower. So yeah, this is a, this is an issue, but it's uh, uh, some kind of issue uh, people can okay uh, can can accept. But other than that, any other? Thought of uh, issue? I imagine it can take a long time to convert if your R is too small. Yeah, of course. Definitely. Any other issue? Maybe it gets smaller and smaller as we approach towards the mission. Yeah, 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 right. Mm -hmm. If R is very large, then jumps the finger, but it never converts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a very good point. So you have to carefully tune R in practice. Otherwise, uh, it might just oscillate. And other thought? If the error is too, uh, if the error is too big and it accumulates, uh, it might cause a very large pocket to the width. If the error is too large? Like the, the Yi minus the width mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. If that is too big for every single I, then if you sum that together, you get a really big problem. Yeah, 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 that's pretty common. So that's why you have to, you already said R to be very small, especially for a highly nonlinear, highly non convex objective function. But I would worry that if you have a lot of data with a lot of features, this could get really unwieldy really fast. Yes, yes, yes. And thanks for all your points. Those are perfect. But here, I want to emphasize. The point you just mentioned. Okay. If you have a lot of data, this is really, really slow. Why? Because uh, when you compute only one gradient element, we need to sum over all the training sets. Like we need to compute the error, the prediction error, with the current model for every training example, multiply with the corresponding feature, and add them together. So remember, this is just for home. This is just to perform one update. You have to go through the whole data set. And this is a time of big data. It's not uncommon that you've got one million training examples, even you know, one billion training examples. So imagine that to perform one step gradient descent, you have to go through one million training examples or one billion training examples. That is an extremely slow. So that's the major issue of the green design. Of course, uh, for the other points, they're perfect, right? You have to very carefully choose the step size R, right? And uh, you have to uh, ensure that your initialization is not bad. Right? Those are all good, right? But uh, I mean, more practical uh, threat is that, okay, once you have a very large data, like even for one update, it may, it may cost you one hour. That's too, that's too bad, right? And how can we alleviate this issue, or how can we address that issue? Right. So from this uh, calculation, what has found that the lead vector is not updated until all errors are calculated right, over the whole training set. Right? So <coughs> our intuition would be, okay, why not we just make early updates? Once we have met some example, we calculate prediction error multiplying with this uh, feature a minus sign. We use that as approximate gradient to update. In this way, whenever I meet an example, I calculate approximation of gradient and perform update. Right? Once you go through a whole data set, see one meaning examples, I can quickly update the model from I have already updated my model one million times. So this, this sounds crazy, right? It sounds, it sounds crazy because you don't know if you just 
we get rid of this uh, summation, right? Just use one product as uh, a substitute of the substitute for the gradient. If it is correct, now of course it's not correct. It's not correct gradient, but it's a very efficient way to update the model. And this method is called stochastic gradient descent, and it has a very strong theoretical guarantees. So if even that means that okay, even every time I, I do a quick update, but very uh, biased, very coarse, and very random update, I can guarantee finally I will converge to the minimum of the object. So here is the idea for the uh, stochastic region. So you repeat for each example x i, meaning that okay, I'm gonna sequentially go through each training example. Then I pretend that the entire training set now is represented by a single example. I just calculate the gradient of the loss on the single example and use that gradient to uh, update our model, namely performing gradient set. Right? Of course, this gradient on the single example is not is not uh, the exact gradient over the entire chain data, right? So we call such a gradient a stochastic gradient. So now let us look at the, the more detailed algorithm steps to conduct stochastic gradient descent for this mean square regression, right? We initialize the vector, and inside this equation, we're going to go through every single example I said, right? I imagine you can you can you kind of like random permutate those examples and stream them, stream them, right? And you look at those examples uh, one by one, right? And for each element of the weak factor, WJ, you just calculate the error using your current weak factor to make predictions. That's the difference between Yi and W transpose Xi. Multiplying with Xij, meaning the J's feature in the current instance Xi, right? And uh, as added to, its, uh, added to WJT, the current uh, weight, you get updates. So here, just uh, uh, because when you calculate the cost gradient, you have a minor sign in front of it, right? And you do the gradient descent, so you subtract. You are subtracted by uh, the gradient. So two negatives end up with positive. That's why you finally end up with positive here. And then you finish the update. You finish one update, right? After you process one single example, right? Now you look at the next example, you do the same thing to calculate the classic gradient, update the weight vector accordingly, and you look at uh, the third example. You do it again and again until you finish passing the whole data set. Now we have an updated data for m times, right? Suppose you have m 10 examples in total. So the biggest difference with the standard gradient descent is that, okay, for standard gradient descent, you're going to accumulate results. Accumulate error and the feature value, their, their product will go through every training example. And then you add them together to get exact gradient, then perform gradient descent. Right? But for stochastic gradient descent, I won't wait. Once I have a, say, an example, I just calculate this. Uh, uh, product of error and feature, and then view that as my approximation of gradient and perform gradient descent. So in this way, I can update uh, my model or the weight vector much, much more frequently than the standard gradient descent. So this updating rule is also called this uh, visual uh, hope rule in a neural network region. So it's very intuitive, uh, but uh, uh, later when we uh, discuss about SVM, uh, we'll, 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 we'll express it in a more uh, formal way, more uh, uh, reverse way. And you will see that uh, even such a simple update, a simple crazy update, they can guarantee uh, uh, your, 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 your weak vectors is going to convert to some uh, uh, minimum of your objective function. And then once you finish passing the whole data set, you finish the 
one iteration, right? So one iteration actually has performed the M updates. Right? You move to the next iteration, and uh, you now go through those training examples again, and uh, each, after dealing with each example, you update the model uh, uh, with that turn immediately. And, and until you finish all the uh, training iterations. So any question regarding the details, the algorithm, algorithm steps? OK, I think this uh, provides uh, enough uh, uh, information for you to implement your stochastic gradient descent uh, for this mean square regression. You will see that why it is uh, working in practice. I mean, on some real data set, you see that it did, it did work, it did, it did work. Okay. So, <clears throat> when you have a large training set, the first choice is always this uh, stochastic gradient descent for online algorithms. Why? Because in that case, uh, uh, the frequency of the model update, meaning that when your data has arrived, uh, you need to update the model uh, as quick as quickly as possible, as frequent as possible. Uh, this is very important in machine learning practice. As people, uh, people always use uh, stochastic descent uh, with large data, and uh, oftentimes people find you know, stochastic gradient descent can get close to often much faster than a batch version. The reason is still because okay, although each time you use standard gradient descent, you use the exact gradient, right? And uh, but to get such an exact gradient, you pay too much price. You have to wait. You have to wait a lot of time to perform one update. Okay. And by, by using stochastic gradient descent, well, every time you make some wrong update, some some kind of wrong update, but as long as you update enough frequently, you can still convert faster than the standard gradient descent frequency. Okay. So now let's talk about uh, the learning rate R. So in general, no matter if you're doing and you're, you're dealing with the uh, uh, green descent or stochastic green descent, uh, the choice of the learning rate R must be very careful. As someone has uh, pointed out, right? if you choose R to be too, too large, then <coughs> it's very likely that your learning trajectory is kind of uh, perturbated a lot and oscillate a lot. It's hard to convert. And here, if you want some direct convergence, you have to schedule R to monotonically decreasing along with number of updates. And uh, you should show that, okay, when the number of updates goes to infinity, your learning rate or step size R goes to zero uh, to show some theoretical convergence. But right now, with the, modern, with the development of modern machine learning algorithms, uh, people won't uh, People won't be too uh, too much worried about the choice of step size because uh, there are a variety of the algorithms uh, which can automatically determine the step size, and also they can even determine per weight step size. Meaning that the the, the step size uh, this R can be associated with a particular weight. Different weight have different step size, and uh, and so that they can they, they can even achieve uh, they can achieve an even faster convergence. Uh, but we're going to um, uh, worry about that. And there are a lot of like automatic libraries like Ada Adam, Ada Grid, uh, Ada Delta, those kind of algorithms um, which provide uh, such kind of functions. And also choosing a better starting point can also have an impact because uh, uh, you know gradient descent is trying to uh, gradually get closer and closer to the optimum, right? If your starting point is close, has already been close to the Autumn, of course, is uh, uh, you you converge faster. So green descent and the uh, stochastic green descent are very simple algorithms. However, almost all all the almost all the algorithms uh, we'll learn in this class uh, can be traced back to green descent for different loss functions and different hypothesis spaces. Uh, we'll see that later. For example, when we talk about uh, uh, the perception at the beginning. We thought, okay, this is just a uh, a lazy learning approach. When we make mistakes, we make some kind of update. But later, we see that this is essentially another stochastic gradient descent algorithm, which has a, a particular design, particularly design objective function. Or loss function. 
Okay. So now we have uh, wrapped up uh, the uh, uh, linear regression case, and, uh, um, and everyone should be uh, well prepared to uh, implement their own version of uh, least mean square regression. To summarize, right, what is linear regression? We want to predict a real bad output, meaning that output is continuous. Right? Using a feature representation of input, the key assumption is that the output is a linear function of the input. And how do we estimate the parameters, namely those weights? We're going to optimize the cost, right? So here, for this mean square regression, we choose uh, a square loss, the summation of the square error over every training example, right? Take half. And we can use two strategies to optimize the cost function. One is called gradient descent, the other is called stochastic gradient descent. And we, we can apply any of them to uh, optimize the function to get best lead factor. However, uh, in addition to this practical algorithm, for this particular problem, uh, we actually can derive an analytical solution, meaning that you even do not need to uh, implement a, an optimization algorithm. How can we do that? Uh, actually, I will leave it as an exercise for you, but to, just to give you uh, some hint. So, Suppose we're given data set x1, y1 to x m, y m, right? We can define the input matrix x and output back to y. So x is essentially just, uh, you know, just uh, uh, put all those input together, uh, input vectors together. So suppose input is d-dimensional, and uh, if you have m ten examples, if you just uh, place them together, you've got an input matrix, which is d by m matrix. And also you can uh, place all the Outputs together, you have a uh, output vector, which is m by 1. Then our square loss function can be simply written as this. So x transpose w is subtracted by y, uh, transpose x transpose w is subtracted by y. So this one is actually the error, the training error. Basically, this is a prediction. x transpose w, and uh, 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 if you do the x transpose, then each row is x. It's a particular instance. Then you times W, you actually got the prediction for every uh, uh, instance. And then subtracted by Y is actually the difference between your prediction and uh, the alpha. And this is a vector. So if you do, this is actually an inner product of this uh, error. So that's why it's called uh, uh, the uh, square error. <coughs> and if you directly solve this problem, meaning that we take the gradient of this uh, Loss with respect to lead vector directly, right? Uh, just recall what we have done uh, in our homework zero. We have reviewed this basic uh, algebra. And you just uh, have the gradient and set the gradient to zero, you will see that it's a linear system. And uh, the optimal lead vector is derived as this x, x transpose inverse xy. So I, I will leave this uh, exercise for you. And, uh, and in the homework, uh, you will. If you will get a chance to compare uh, the difference between the learned lead vector from your reading descent or stochastic reading descent uh, and your optimal weight derived uh, analytically. Okay.